and endorses global peace. Nigeria loves and endorses global peace. Honduras ama y respalda a global peace. La République du Congo par ma voix soutient et aime l'initiative Global Peace. Chile ama y respalda la paz global. We love and endorse global peace. República Dominicana ama y apoya la paz mundial. We love and endorse global peace. Loves and endorses global peace. Nosotros amamos y apoyamos la paz global. And Antigua loves and endorses global peace. Iran loves and endorses global peace. Nous aimons et soutenons global peace. Australia loves and endorses global peace. Loves and endorses global peace. Israel loves and endorses global peace. Nous sommes pour la paix dans le monde. Nous sommes global peace. Ama y respalda a global peace. Israel loves and supports global peace. Egypt loves and endorses global peace. Most of the time, to aid the salam and alam. I love and endorse global peace. Here in the USA, we support global peace. The United Arab Emirates. Loves and endorses global peace. Nicaragua loves and endorses global peace. We love and endorse global peace. We love and endorse global peace. Puerto Rico ama y respalda al global peace. Niger love and endorse global peace. Venezuela quiere y respalda global peace. We are from global peace in the air. Mubotswana rata global peace ibile rai rotuet pula. Barbados loves and endorses global peace. Kenya loves and endorses global peace. Indonesia loves and endorses global peace. We love and endorse global peace. Somalia loves and supports global peace. We love and endorse global peace. Much love from Portugal. Morocco loves and endorses global peace. O Brasil ama e apoia a paz global. Amamos e endorsamos a paz global. Ang Pilipinas ay kaisa sa pagmamahal at pagtatagulod ng global peace. 
Guatemala ama y respalda a Global Peace. Gana Laos and endorses Global Peace. India, Bharat, Vishya Shandi ko pyaar karta hai aur isko samarthan bhi karta hai. Tunisia endorses Global Peace. Good day, good afternoon, buenos días, buenas tardes, bon dia, boa tarde, bonjour, bon après-midi. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the Global Peace Youth Day 2021. This is an opportunity for all Global Peace citizens to meet and discuss the issues that most concern the youth. The topic we will address in this event is of the great importance for an imperative need for our society transforming food system, youth innovation for a sustainable future. Now, before we proceed on, let announce to you our social media handles. They are Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our website, globalpeace.me. Follow us, like us, pass, comment, and share our success stories, and let's change the world. All this information will be put in the chat box so that you can more access to read. We are also broadcasting live via our Facebook page, Global Peace, Global Peace HQ. And for the purpose of this event, we want to everyone to switch off your microphones. Switch, if you are not speaking, you should always put your screen on speaker mode, unless you want to take picture then you switch to the gallery mode. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, obrigado, merci. Now let's get rolling. This event brings us all together for a global celebration of Youth Day. We will cover a fairly diverse program which will cover four different sessions. The first will be an introduction by our special guest. The second will be the participation of our speakers from all continents. The third will be a question and answer session with our speaker from the different part of the world. And for fourth and last will be the breakout session where we will divide ourselves into the groups to discuss some topic designated based on the theme for today's event. This is where you will all have the opportunity to speak each other. I want to thank everyone for participating in this event and invite you to actively participate in this beautiful event designed for the youth celebration. Thank you very much. I'm Ross Rodriguez. I'm here to represent the Global Peace Portugal, and I'm very happy to be here with you to share with our great speakers, uh, for our guests and moderators in this wonderful event to build a better world possible. I want to take this opportunity to introduce uh, uh, a man behind this very important event, the man who works 24 seven to make this happen. He's the distinguished coordinator of campaign and advocacy global, yeah. my dear friend and brother, Mr. Kolba Asamani. Mr. Kolba Asamani, you warmly welcome. Thank you very much, Ross. That was a very wonderful presentation. And that I never thought you'd get to this far because um, speaking four different languages, Spanish, French, Portuguese, English, is quite a very difficult task. And I'm very glad you're doing uh, very well. Um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me also congratulate our distinguished founder, Professor Vasugondin, who is here with us and the rest of my colleagues in the office and everybody who has made it very possible, taking um, uh, time off their busy schedule to be here with us this very wonderful day. Um, it's been since 2009, um, the International Youth Day has been celebrated and this year, 12th of August, is the first time that Global Peace as a global institution championing the course of youth development across the world has taken up the mantle to join the numerous organizations that have been celebrating this day and indeed, it has been very, very wonderful because a lot of um, global citizens from across the world have gathered here today to chat a new cause for uh, global youth development and to 
document our achievements, listen to the challenges, uh, look for solutions that we can resolve uh, to commit young people to uh, global development. I'm excited that um, global peace citizens have met today. Um, let me also take this opportunity to introduce um, our executive director and founder of Global Peace, Dr. Vazu Gondin, the brain behind this very uh, wonderful institution that is move, um, looking forward to be a frontliner in terms of youth development globally. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the founder of Global Peace is um, the executive director of the African Center of Constructive Resol Resolution of Disputes, which he founded in 1992. Uh, in, 2000, in 2018, Dr. Vasu founded Global Peace to mobilize a global constituency to strengthen the multilateral, uh, multilateralism and to build a better world for all mankind. Over the last 29 years, Dr. Vasu Gondin has been involved in preparing conflict parties across Africa for political um, conflicts uh, and negotiations, including the Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Somalia and many others. He prepared conflict parties in negotiation and supported the mediation efforts of many former presidents in, in Africa, including former president Obasanyo uh, Masira of Botswana, uh, Chisano of Mozambique, and former president Nelson Mandela. As a result of, as a result of, of his distinguished service uh, to his organization, accord and to Africa, the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania University has, as always for the last uh, many years, 10 years or so, uh, been decorating Accord as one of the best 100 think tanks in the world. And I think the last time we were in the, in the last 30 distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is the man who put together global peace for all of us to be, uh, to be beneficiary. So um, I will now welcome our distinguished founder, Dr. Vazugondin, to take the floor. Thank you and welcome Dr. Vazugondin. Thank you very much, uh, Kobla. Uh, you didn't have to give such a long introduction. Uh, I think my uh, best accolade is that I can spend time with uh, young leaders uh, from across the world. Uh, Roz, let me thank you, Roz, uh, for moderating this session. Uh, wonderful to see you again also. Uh, and I have to say, uh, you're doing a great job. Uh, Kobla was telling me about your dry run yesterday. And I said, well, I, today I can see you're doing a wonderful job of it. So let me uh, say we're talking about food systems and uh, sustainable food systems and the role of young people. Let me, let me, let me start. As, as you can see from my gray hair, I'm a lot older than most of you. Uh, and so I, I want to reflect when we talk about food systems, because, you know, food and food systems and food sustainability is a factor of uh, demographic trends in the world. As populations increase over thousands of years and hundreds of years, uh, we have to change the way in which we look at uh, how we produce and how we consume food. And as you move into the future, as the new leaders of the world, you will have to take care of 8 billion people on the planet. Uh, those who came before you 100, 200 years ago, maybe only had to take care of 1 billion people. So the demands and the complexity of dealing with food and food sustainability was a very different challenge for the leaders of those days and it's going to be a, increasingly a much more complex challenge for yourself. So let me reflect when I was growing up, when I was growing up in the uh, 60s, so let me say a long time ago now, uh, a lot of what we ate was actually grown in, at the back of our house. So my mother and my grandmother would go into the garden and they would plant a lot of the food the beans and the millets and all the rest of the things that uh, we would consume. And I, I suspect if you go and talk to your parents in many parts of the world, you talk to your grandparents in many parts of the world, they will tell you the same thing, that a lot of what uh, they ate during that time was grown in the garden for many reasons. Firstly, I think uh, there were no supermarkets like you have today. 
where you can just walk into a building and you can buy everything that you need and everything is pre-packaged for you to buy. In those days, there were no such thing as supermarkets. People never had fridges at home so that they could buy stock uh, stuff and they could store it in their fridges. So they, they, they uh, produced and consumed from their own uh, gardens. And you see that it, during that period, I can tell you, many of us never saw the doctor for a long, long time. I think I have seen the doctor more in the last 10 years than I have seen the doctor in the re previous decades of my life. And that was really because we ate a lot of natural products that came out of our gardens that was not contaminated with fertilizers and all the rest of it. And we, the food was not mass produced at that time. Now you find if you go to a city like New York, you, you know, which is a huge metropolis, uh, with at least 7 million people, I think, in New York, uh, you will find that people are going back to community gardens. They are going back to household gardens, and you will find there are little plots of land where people now go and plant uh, their food stuff. If you go to London and you go to the suburbs of London, you will find the same thing, that people have little plots of land where they go and grow their stuff. It's partly a hobby partly, of course, for uh, subsistence uh, food that they will grow there. But of course, when you're dealing with 8 billion people on a planet, you can't talk about subsistence farming. You have to talk about farming at a mass scale and production of food at a mass scale to feed all of the people that are there. And unfortunately, our patterns of production and our patterns of consumption are not done in an equitable way across the world. So whereas when I grew up, we were still talking about subsistence farming and eating food that we had produced. When I got to the United States uh, in the early 90s uh, to study for uh, my degree at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, I, I found for the first time just how much a nation can consume in food and how much a single nation can waste in food. Because in the United States, and those of you who are from the United States, you will know, the US is a huge consumer of food from across the world, but it also produces its own food. So it has huge food security. But Americans also waste a lot of food. And yet, if you fly all the way across to another part of the world, like Somalia, for that matter, or in the 80s, if you went to uh, Ethiopia, you would find that there would be famine and people would be starving. So, you know, we find obesity on the one side that might come from uh, overconsumption of uh, food, uh, but also consumption of the wrong type of food. And then you find famine on the other side because of the inability to produce food in a way that can be sustainable. So, this is a huge, huge challenge for us going forward. And this will be the challenge for your generation. As you go into the future, this is going to be one of your biggest challenges. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to put up a few slides in, in, in a minute or two uh, that come out of the latest report from the International Panel on Climate Change. This was a report that was just released a few days ago by this international panel coming out of the United Nations. And what it shows is just how serious the situation on climate change is and the impact that we as human beings have had on the climate and why you as young people, because many of you are in your 20s, many of you are in your 30s, but in the next two decades, you will be the leaders of the world. But what world will you be leading? Will you be leading a world of innovation where we will be able to innovate to sustain the future, your future, the future of your children? Or are we going to enter a world that is completely destroyed with many challenges and you as leaders are going to have to find ways to manage an enormous amount of disasters? We are dealing with, as we move into the future, viruses. We see now with the COVID-19 pandemic, it's only the beginning of a number of viruses. They say that there are about 2,000 viruses that
that exist in the world that we don't know about yet. So you're going to have that as a challenge. And we have seen during the onset of COVID, the breakdown in supply chains that meant that we would also have food shortages. You have cybercrime, which is a big challenge. You have armed conflict, that is a big challenge. And now you have uh, climate change. All of these challenges will impact negatively on food security. And as you know, without the right kind of subsistence, uh, without the right kind of food, or without food at all, we won't survive as humanity. And so you will be challenged in the future. So I'm going to ask Keenan to put up this slide. The latest. The latest international panel on climate change. So Keenan, if you can put up those slides. And you will all see very graphically the challenge that you will face going into the future. Okay, so this is the official uh, UN uh, panel. Next slide. So what it says is that recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid, and intensifying, and unprecedented in thousands of years. So for thousands of years, our climate remained more or less stable until the last 50 to 100 years, when we started to industrialize, when we started to use fossil fuels, oil, gas, et cetera, and, we, and that released a lot of carbon into the atmosphere, which created a blockage that now uh, results in global warming. And you will see the, the uh, consequences of that. Next slide. So the, if you look at carbon dioxide concentration, it's the highest in at least 2 million years. We've never seen this level for 2 million years. The rise of sea levels, the fastest rates in at least 3,000 years. So for 3,000 years, we've never seen this kind of rise. But yes, suddenly we are seeing a rise in uh, sea levels. Arctic sea ice, the lowest level in at, at least 1,000 years, which means that the ice is now melting. And then the glacier retreats unprecedented in at least 2,000 years. So for 2,000 years, it was very stable. And suddenly, we see all of these glaciers. So even if you go to Kilimanjaro, one of the highest mountains in Africa, if you don't go in the next five to 10 years, you will not see the glacier on the mountain because it's melting at that uh, fast rate. Now, if we look at the impact we've had, what we are seeing is extreme heat, more frequent, more intense heat across the world, heavy rainfall, more frequent, more intense rainfall, drought across the world. We are seeing fires. You've seen a fire in Greece recently. Uh, oceans are warming and acidifying and losing oxygen. Once an ocean loses oxygen, it also threatens our seafood. Next slide. Unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gases, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, this will be beyond our reach. So that's the target that countries are going for by 2030, 1.5 uh, uh, degrees Celsius. And then it is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall, and drought uh, more frequent and severe. Next slide. Climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways. So this is a common challenge, and this is why we establish global peace, so that you as young people can come together to meet the common challenges of the world. And one of the most serious common challenges is climate change and its impact on food sustainability. There you see, again, annual rainfall on land. You see this across the world. The monsoons are changing also. Next slide. The climate we experience in the future depends on our decision. So Keenan, just freeze this slide. I want you all to focus on this slide and focus on the message that comes out of this slide. What it says is the climate we experience in the future, which is your future, because you will be the leaders of the future. The climate we experience in the future depends on our decisions today. And that's why we set up Global Peace so you can dialogue with your leaders and you can tell your leaders today that they have to make the right decision so that we can all live in a better world in the future when you lead that world and you will be able 
to ensure that we have sustainable food systems in the world and the innovations that come out of yourselves to protect the environment and protect food systems is what the future will rely on, what your future will depend on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now we're going to enjoy the video of Mrs. Puncila Lambo Nakuka, PhD Undersecretary General and Executive Director of the UN Women. Today, we mark Global Peace Youth Day. I'd like to greet you on this very important day. We know that food insecurity contributes towards wars, displacement of people, and immeasurable suffering. This is a situation that we all need to pay attention to, but we need our young people to be present in these debates and action because they can bring a lot of insights, creativity, innovation that would help us to solve these situations. I would like to express UN Women's commitment to work with young people all over the world, in Africa in particular, in order to make sure that we fight against climate change. We make sure that our land can produce, but also that we fight for peace and make sure that the land that we need in order to feed our, feed our people is made available and it is protected from the hazardous conditions that comes with the changing climate. I wish you a wonderful youth day that celebrates the importance of peace. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to hear a fair hand the perspectives of our special guest, Ms. Puncile Lambo Nakuka, PhD, UN Undersecretary General and Executive Director of the UN Women, and our founder, Dr. Vaso Gondin, for the sterling speech. Now, we will enjoy the performance from our friends of Cayman Island Ring Chaser video. Get us rolling. Well, we have uh, 
little bit technical problems, but uh, we were gonna wait for the our techniques. But it's a wonderful video of the John Dancer of Cayman Island. Well, um, I am pleased to introduce in this second part of the event our distinguished speakers from all continents who give uh, us knowledge, experience, and their speeches. From Gold Peace Japan, representing Asia, I have the pleasure to introduce a Paola Bellucci Ortolan. Hello, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Paola, I'm a Brazilian, and I'm living in Japan. So that's why I'm representing the Global Peace Movement here in Asia. I'm the founder of a child protection campaign called Ninguém Mexe Comigo in Portuguese. So it means nobody messes with me. I also advocate for SDGs. So today my speech is about youth innovation and food systems transformation. There is a large and tepid reservoir of employment opportunities in the agri-food sector. However, the youth today live in a world facing a convergence of crises, including climate and environmental change and global inequalities in food security, nutrition, employment, and human well-being. These existing trends have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, necessitating a radical transformation of global and local food systems. In many countries, Despite the great diversity of contexts, the observation is the same. It's urgent to strengthen the appeal of agriculture and food systems to young people in order to secure the future. The potential returns of investing in young people are boundless in terms of food security, poverty reduction, employment generation, as well as peace and political stability. In the near term, self-employment in the informal sector will likely present the greatest opportunity for generating youth employment, particularly in low-income countries. Throughout the world, and specifically in de developing countries, there are growing youth population coupled with declining job opportunities. Thus, while there is some evidence that the youth are not attracted to agriculture and are leaving the sector, the absolute numbers of youth who are dependent on farming or livestock production is likely to increase because of exponential population growth. The best entry point for youth into agribusiness and in turn food systems innovation is to turn to modern agriculture practice, use of technology and opportunities for quick money with relatively higher returns than staple crops policies and initiatives to protect and strengthen youth engagement and employment in food systems needs to be based on the pillars of rights, equity, agency, and recognition. The redistribution of resources, knowledge, and opportunities for youth innovation and engagement in the development of context-specific employment and labor policies can not only contribute to creating jobs for youth, but can also directly support transitions to sustainable food systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paola, for this amazing presentation. Now, our second speaker from Global Peace Botswana, representing Africa, Mr. Mompati Sean Mahuta. It's, it's inevitable that anything occurring outside of its conducive environment will ultimately fail. It's said that in today's world, we are plagued with circumstances that corner us into a tight space and condemn us to this failure. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. You know, despite these impediments that we face, I believe that the solution we may need to rise above the perilous season that we find ourselves in is collaboration and financing. That is the environment I feel is necessary for us to be able to cultivate it so that we can cultivate it amongst ourselves to be able to hone and harness transformations and innovations. You know, because of Wilbur and Oval Wright, 
we can connect continents in a matter of hours. And because of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, we have intuitive devices like the iPhone and the iPad. And because of Bill Gates and Paul Allen, we have personal computing. And I know that the list is endless, but these are just universal fingertip examples of how collaborations are integral in transforming and providing useful innovation to improve the quality of life. So big breakthroughs and progress cannot happen in silos. When we collaborate, we are sort of like generating the kind of energy that fuels growth and creativity. It is thereafter through access to this that we can have capital, that we can do and do what we aspire to achieve. I'd like to give you practical examples with the context of Africa. In Uganda, a young guy called Elliot Mwebaze created a bicycle dynamo, which converts energy from bicycles to electrical energy. And this can charge mobile phones within two hours. In Kenya, there is Fufi Power and Light Limited, which has invented solar motorcycles. In Ghana, Salma Okonko was building the biggest solar farm in the country. In Namibia, there was a student who created a wireless phone which uses radio frequencies and doesn't need airtime, doesn't need whichever plan to make a call. And similarly, that list is endless. And I'd like this to dawn in our minds that transformations and innovations are becoming more and more frequent in our world, more especially by the youth. And though this is commendable, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Here we are finding ourselves with opportunities for collaboration. And the problem that Vasu has just talked about lies before us, food security and sustainability. However, there are so many socioeconomic factors that make it difficult for the guy in Uganda to send his inventions to Botswana, to South Africa, to the USA, to everywhere in the world. And I'm pretty much sure that the investor in Uganda not only wants to reach his people and other countries similarly. So innovations like these are not able to reach other areas from environmental condition, issues of political stability and access to capital facilities and so on and so forth. So there's no need for us to reinvent the wheel, but rather there's a need for us to make more wheels available to those who need it. And in this sense, we are working towards a common goal by having established a common purpose. So imagine solar farms in Africa, in Europe and the world and the impact that these can create. Imagine what this can do for rural communities. And in a time where we are facing energy shortages, we need innovative solutions to help drive the change that we want to see. And no matter how much we may try to shy away from this idea, funding crazy ideas is where we are going to liberate the entire human race. A couple of years ago, who would have thought of a plane, a car, a robot? They at some point were just crazy ideas. So why don't we embrace our youth and help them to believe in themselves? Let's set up collaborations with other youth, with other youth who are already doing amazing things so that we can already improve on the structures that we have. And if we build these partnerships and if we finance these partnerships, then we are harnessing the strengths and abilities of others from different vantage points. And this is one of the most strategic ways for us to be able to scale up innovation and solve these complex problems that we find ourselves in. What is it about the inventors in Ghana? What is it about the inventors in the USA? What is it about the inventors in Europe? Are they special? Of course not. But if we put enough resources on the table and we work towards this goal, then it's more likely for us to be able to create that necessary environment that will support knowledge exchange. Ladies and gentlemen, knowledge is power. Collaboration and subsequent access to resources or funding are pivotal in this sense because it affords us the opportunity to do what we want to do in a large scale. And like I said, more wheels for everyone. And just a message to my fellow Africans that currently we have about 18 billionaires in the continent, about 80,000 millionaires and still counting. This affords us an opportunity now to not only rely on government. At times government will support us, but at, at times government will face us. So ultimately we need to turn to each other to instigate the dawn of a new era. 
And only then will we realize that we, have, that we had the power all along. And in closing, I know I'm running out of time. I'd like to share a very personal story. Early last year, a young Motswana was contracted by the Rwandan government at the tune of, I think, 2.1 million US dollars to come to make sanitary pads and um, medical isolation equipment. Now for this deal to happen, he himself came up with an initiative to contact, I believe that it was the free, the period initiative. Um, he contacted the founder and he donated 5,000 sanitary pads. So the person of free, the period initiative then donated those pads to the Ministry of Health and Family Promotion. That's when the Rwandan government was now able to uh, find out about these innovative solutions. Now, from that result and from that business deal, the Rwandan government is going to donate all those pets to all school going children. Isn't that the world that we want? Now, think of that in agriculture, think of that in education, think of that in any sphere that you can imagine. Then we'll be solving real problems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mompati. It's very interesting to hear your perspective on this most important subject. Friends, remember the time limit for the speeches, okay? Now it's the turn of, of our third speaker, my colleague Priscilla Tatani of Global Peace Sweden, representing Europe. Hi everybody, good morning, afternoon, evening. Thank you so much for the opportunity of being here with these distinguished speakers, Global Peace. I'm very honored. It's my pleasure to talk about a subject that touches my heart. I hope you enjoy what I have to talk. Well, the economic and population growth of the modern era caused our demand for food to increase. So the lands that were previously multi-cultivated little by little were transformed into huge monocultures with resource intensive farming systems, which have caused massive deforestation, water scarcities, soil depletion, and high levels of greenhouse gas emissions, which destroyed part of our biodiversity. Not only that, the cultivation of these monocultures meant that the poorest population was supplied with a reduced variety of foods making this population more nourished and sick. With a difficult access to land, most owners, where most owners are older people, agriculture is no longer an interesting practice for young people and low wages have made agribusiness even less attractive. This then generated the migration of young people to the big cities in search of better opportunities. The reality that young people face today is that they have a twice less likely the chance to find a decent work opportunities than an adult. This is because the culture we have of the young person being inexperienced and this should have to be reversed. By 2050, low income countries will see an increment of a 15 to 24 age group in Africa, around the 375,000 young people will enter the labor market by 2030. The vast majority of them are in rural areas with limited access to land, poor working conditions, and restricted access to finance. The agribusiness sector is challenging, but also is a great opportunity to change this scenario. We can create a decent and sustainable leading positions for these young people who will come with the workforce and knowledge. We must support these young people so that they can grab the chance and transform the agricultural sector into a sustainable source of good food, nutritious food, and a decent source of income. For this, we need to work together with the government and partners integrate technology and entrepreneurship for small farm owners, and above all, make the sector more attractive and profitable for the youth, including food education in the early age and investing in training. The government must invest in soil restoration and water conservation to revive local agro agroecology systems. 
the pandemic showed us not only our interdependence with each other, but with the ecology, the correlation of animals and human health. Land and the environment must be rehabilitated, considering the biodiversity and enhancing the natural resources. We need to work on the right of the people to have a right to the natural resources and property, that people and the youth have the right to plant what they want instead of just a crop. We also need to build the confidence and empowerment of these young people so that they can lead and take the initiative and be part of the planning and implementation of a process that these farms require. That way, they can manage the social and financial capital of their businesses. Considerable transformations of food systems, rural economies, and natural resource management will be needed if you want to overcome these numerous challenges. We must all realize the full potential of food and agriculture to ensure security and healthy future for all people in this world. We need you to include the youth innovation for a sustainable future. Thank you, Russ. Thank you very much, Priscilla. Another excellent speech once again. Our fourth speaker comes from Global Peace Venezuela, representing South America, Josmar Telo Maita. Hello, everyone. Honorable keynote speaker, guest speakers, guests of honor, United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women, and audience around the world. I'm absolutely pleased to represent John South American Young Leaders. This International Youth Day is centered on innovation and a vision of a world in which individuals, businesses, and nations can all look forward to sustainable and equitable food systems. Since the pandemic post-COVID world has revealed more than any other moment in the contemporary history that the human race needs local cooperation to restructure economies to take full advantage of emerging technologies. Cooperation is instrumental to see beyond our own dishes and to understand the impact of food systems in local economies especially in places like Venezuela, where I come from. My country has a similar narrative to many other countries in the global south. These emerging markets can be a symbol of unlocked innovation if we stand for education and meaningful youth engagement. According to the Global Youth Mobilization Initiative, COVID-19 has impacted the life of 1.2 billion young people across the globe. Young people worldwide are not in training, education, or employment. An uneven number of those young people are young women. And yet, many responses to the pandemic currently overlook opportunities to engage young women in coming up with the solutions that can help us build back a much gender equal and sustainable world. The pandemic has worsened the 16 inequalities in our societies with respect to access to resources, information, and power. In other words, COVID-19 has made life harder for the girls and young women. These are just few reasons to enable sustainable food systems that involve young women to create better education and opportunities. Innovative approaches must include young women, especially in South America where they are significantly affected by food insecurity. There has never been a better time than now to increase the presence of women and recognize them as fundamental actors, knowledge holders, and innovators. This is why we must increase economic remuneration and recognition of young women's contribution to food and nutrition insecurity in a region sharing and co-creating knowledge for sustainable production systems from a gender-based mindset can be a way to nurture the next generation of young women entrepreneurs. For instance, educational interventions in public elementary schools in Paraná, Brazil, where the entire school community and children's family learn about agroecology. 
in spite of the hard work and important work that women do contributing to food and nutrition security, land and services continue to be handled by men at a greater proportion. However, empowerment processes of rural women can be an answer on this matter. For instance, rural women associations in Cundinamarca, Colombia. In fact, women experience numerous benefits from leading in food systems, such as increased self-confidence, economic autonomy, increased decision-making skills, new income sources, possibilities to access to financial assistance programs, and the creation of new technical knowledge related to food processing. What are we waiting for to offer more training spaces for young women and recognize their important role in innovative food systems? Thank you. Thank you very much, Josmar. Excellent speech, very interesting, thank you. And the fifth and the final speaker of this second session, I have the pleasure to, in, of introducing to you David Sol Acosta from Global Peace USA, representing North America. Hello, everyone. It is such a thrill to be able to speak to you all on this special day dedicated to youth representation and empowerment. My name is David Salacosta. I am currently a master's candidate at Harvard University where I'm pursuing my studies in international relations while also serving on the University Sustainability Council for students and climate action leaders on campus. As we gather for this youth dialogue, it is important to remember why we have all chosen to be part of this special day. For too long, youth have been underrepresented under represented, and not provided the means to have their voice heard in institutions of power. But as we have seen in recent times, and as is perfectly displayed here today, there is nothing but positive things to be gained when youth are represented, empowered, and included in the institutions that govern over our global society. Coming from the United States, I have been fortunate to have many opportunities to pursue my passions. It has been here where I have been able to excel in my studies, contribute meaningfully to the environmental protection of my country's natural lands and waterways, and actively partake in efforts to boost climate action practices and policies in every aspect of my life and in that of my university, community, and country. It is a testament to the power of opportunity and how countries the world over must adopt policies that enable youth to excel and fulfill their untapped potential and boundless talent. That is why today I am encouraging global leaders to work on efforts that ensure the inclusion and participation of youth in their respective governments and societies. For we could only build a world reflective of our truest self when we include the hopes and aspirations of our youngest people. That could not be more true than in Africa, where more than 40% of the population is under the age of 15. Just think, there are now hundreds of millions of people growing up, attending school, and eager to make a difference. As leaders, we have to do what we can to ensure that we're able to live in a world where their life and that of their hopes and dreams matter. It's why I call on leaders to draft budgets that invest in youth, research and development and to enact policies and promote economic growth and innovation for it is through these actions that we could expand the reaches of opportunity and uplift the hopes of millions with dignity and purpose. To close, we must look ahead. We must not be distracted by the day-to-day -day challenges of the present and think of the future we'd all want to live and be a part of and start building it. Progress doesn't just come due to the sheer passage of time. It's fought for and forged through the hard work of many. And after hearing from many of you already here today and seeing everyone that is in attendance, I know our generation is up for the challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. It was a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, these were our distinguished speakers representing their continents from Japan, Botswana, Sweden, USA, and Venezuela. All the young people gave us excellent contributions 
which will surely make or reflect a lot and expands upon the point of each one, making it clear that we young people are willing to work for the betterment of our world. It's now time for the third uh, part of this event, which is the follow-up questions to the speeches read by our discussed speakers. We will now call on our continental guest speakers to respond to these questions. The first, per the first persons to speak is uh, Kemone Loe Patoli from Global Peace South Africa, representing the continent of Africa. This is the question, my friend. With 60% of the world arable lands being in Africa, why do we still have to import food? How can youth make a change so Africa produce for itself and the world? Hello, hello everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm based in South Africa and I'm looking forward to this conversation. So in my view, Africa has the largest population of youth in the world with 60% of the African population being under the age of 25. So what does this pose um, for the African economy? What does it pose for the future of Africa? What does it pose for innovation and trade? And what does it propose for basic human needs such as water and lastly, such as food? There is a famous quote that says that he who feeds you actually controls you. So that being evident with the rampant um, levels of hunger and poverty on the African continent, the continent has the potential to produce and process their own food as well as build their own food systems. The continent has 60% of the world's arable land, but what are we doing with it? We are still importing, which needs to change. The world is moving into a conscious age where biodiversity and sustainability are key factors in considering any undertaking, any growth and any project. Within food production cons and consumption, the focus would require organic and sustainable practices in place. Africa currently imports around $35 billion worth of food annually, and the increase in the imports directly affect the yield and the output, as well as the agricultural practices on African soil. It affects the economy, it affects the entrepreneurship, and it affects the ability to trade between young Africans. Africa needs to focus on food security, and it can achieve that, and here's how. These are the areas we need to focus on for the sustainable development in the agricultural space. We need to focus on youth innovation and entrepreneurship. We need to focus on sustainability. We need to strengthen trade relations in the continent through policies and practices such as the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. And we need to look at the policies on land reclaims and land reforms. The, um, the sustainable development goals, the second sustainable development goals focuses on zero hunger and that is a goal. To achieve zero hunger, the continent needs to produce their own food independently first and foremost. The young people of this continent do have a zeal, they have the energy, they have the potential, they have the skills for entrepreneurship, innovation and trade. So countries mm -hmm. need to invest in their young skills because not only is this the largest population on the continent, this is the population of the future. In South Africa alone, according to the Statistics South Africa General Household Survey of 2018, only 14.8% of families were active in agricultural practices during that time. That is only 14% in a population of 59 million people. To encourage agriculture in South Africa, the land question needs to be answered. And according to the National Development Plan of 2030, the government aims to have a million hectares dedicated to agricultural practice. These goals require young people to be supported, enabled, and educated to take the necessary steps in being sustainable farmers. Sustainability means that government must play a role in bringing innovative practice alongside traditional methods. Um, from an educational and funding and support perspective. We, we need to look at vertical farming, hydroponic farming, and other methods of innovation in farming for better risk mitigation and better sustainability from an economic practice perspective. We need to look at the economic value chain and integrating policies that make intra-Africa trade affordable, favorable, and viable. 
the post-colonial position we find ourselves in would require an honest conversation around the land debate and an honest approach on how to best utilize the 60% of arable land we have as a continent. Reforms need to take place where required. Young people need to be trained, invested in, and supported for trade. And the overall culture and the mindset of the continent needs to be united so that we can collaborate. The young people of this continent are ready to work in collaboration and make this continent the breadbasket of the world. The answer is invest in your young people. The answer is invest in sustainable systems. The answer is let's collaborate to reach the sustainable development goals and make sure that this continent is self-sustainable and can serve as a breadbasket for the world where we export nutritious, healthy, and affordable food, therefore addressing food security. Thank you very much. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Kimone Loe. That was an impressive remarks. And we now move to Middle East, represented by Sarah Fagwas Kadam from Global Peace Syria. Your question is, Asia has experienced a green revolution, but does not have enough arable lands to be self-sufficient. How can youth build solidarity with the other part of the world that have enough land so knowledge can be shared to build sustainable food system for the whole world. Greetings everyone, this is Sarah Haddam from Syria. Pleased to meet you all in Global Youth Day. Every year we commemorate Global Youth Day to give youth opportunities to raise their voice and spread their actions and initiative around the world. So thank you so much for this opportunity to us as youth to share this experience and thoughts. And for a uh, 2021 theme is transforming food system, youth innovation for a sustainable future. Also, my question is close enough to this goal. Theoretically, it's easy, but we need to implement it practically. It's not that easy. First of all, we need to guide economy to bring states more regular. Though, thus, it allows legal obstacle to be moved. Sarah, you are on mute. Okay. Is it good? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, practically it's not that easy to, to implement all these steps. First of all, we need to guide economy to legal obstacles to, to bring states more liberal. Those it allows legal obstacles to be removed. Also provide motivation that police economy to play its role effectively. That leads to a win chances. It also leads a bigger incentive. The, uh, the, the win chances come through demanding planting. I mean, providing markets for so all the projects will be in entry scalable. Focusing on individual, we need to create a property protection and laws for intellectual property protection. Thus, the member can always develop technology and offer their innovative, innovative ideas supported and protected by the laws. We need several terms to achieve this goal, more liberal states, more openness, which is globalization and property protection. The most important term is movement by the government to implement these actions, which put us facing with political embedment, especially here in Middle East that is governed by strict laws, laws prevent us from supporting our state progress. Youth alone couldn't be a solidarity without collaboration by government. Also governments couldn't achieve a sustainable trade system without providing the protection for individual property. It's a two-way process to exchange knowledge globally and achieve the sustainable development goals, especially the, 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 the second one, which is zero hunger. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was impressive remarks. We will now go to Europe to listen from them as well. From Europe is Daniela Ovalles Marco from Global Peace Switzerland. Please listen your question. How do we ensure an effective business environment that will attract youth to be fully involved in agricultural related activities 
that promotes the transformation of food system for a global food sustainability. Hello everyone, good morning, afternoon or evening to all the participants. I'm pleased to join this panel on such an important day, day as it is uh, the International Youth Day. So to answer to this question, uh, transforming food systems to deliver the SDGs by 2030 will require action by everyone everywhere. For this reason, youth have also to be included as key actors to make an impact to better food and sustainable systems. We should not only prioritize their recognition, but also provide adequate environments where youth can develop their full potential. We need to inspire them, empower them, provide them the skills so they can develop their leadership potential. As we have discussed today, you might have seen that the agri-food system can provide so many employment opportunities for young people and therefore improve the society's overall well-being. Yet, there are challenges that block youth involvement in many areas of the world. Issues such as limited access to land, natural resources, infrastructure, finance, technology, markets, uh, knowledge, and poor working conditions, which makes the sector to be considered less attractive and sustainable for youth. So to build an effective business environment, we need to implement interventions and policies that can effectively address the, these concerns. As a first step, to support youth employment and engagement in food system, we must recognize the diversity of youth aspirations and experience across the globe. Younger generation are selective about the places that they work because they are more interested in working for causes that hold their same ideals and passions and will in turn foster the ability to make a positive change in the world. Once we understand the context we're working on, it is important to have an effective communication. Achievement for a transformative food system will be accelerated if, we are, if there is a strong commitment to listening to, acting upon, and respecting the voices of young women and men of different ages, classes, socioeconomic conditions, and ability. So policymakers must therefore ensure that young women and men are brought within the inner circle of decision making including with uh, governments, the private sector and civil society. The next thing to consider is that we should invest in young people and provide learning opportunities so they can develop a whole range of important skills to, to, to succeed in life, such as leadership, uh, decision-making, teamwork, communication, planning and prioritizing, self-confidence and more technical skills related to the agricultural sector. Continuously, we need to ensure fair compensation for youth labor while working towards better working conditions, job creation, and youth engagement. When possible, we should support youth-led startup initiatives, which require a supportive policy environment that addresses effectively the rights, equity, action, and recognition. Finally, and with this, I want to close my remarks, it is important to evaluate, monitor, and enhance the transparency of the progress of youth participation in food systems. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daniela. It was a brilliant response. Thank you. Now we move to South America, represented by Jocelyn Susoli Marroquin Lopez from Global Peace Guatemala. She will speak in Spanish and I will translate in English. Your question is. In what ways can we collectively nurture youth entrepreneurs who can best manage and support food system development in the food uh, in the post COVID-19 world? Hola, muy buenos días, muchas gracias. Eh, para mí es un honor pues desde ya estar acá con ustedes y con respecto a la pregunta es designar En este caso, nuestro, nuestros sistemas de alimentarios están fallando y la pandemia está empeorando aún más las cosas. A menos de que adoptemos de inmediato, cada vez está más claro también que hay una emergencia alimentaria mundial que podría tener repercusiones a largo plazo para cientos de millones de niños y adultos. Es posible que millones de personas más caigan en la pobreza extrema debido al 
la crisis del COVID-19. Los emprendedores debemos actuar ahora para evitar los peores efectos de nuestros esfuerzos para controlar la pandemia. Designar los alimentos y de nutrición como esenciales al tiempo que aplican las protecciones apropiadas para los trabajadores del sector de alimentación. Significa poner alimentos en los países que sufren crisis alimentarias para reforzar y ampliar los sistemas de protección social atendiendo las necesidades de liquidez de los productores de alimentos en pequeñas escalas y las empresas rurales. Dos, debemos reforzar los sistemas de protección social para la nutrición. Los países deben adoptar y ampliar los programas de protección social para atender a los grupos de riesgo desde el punto de vista de nutrición. Ello incluye apoyar a los niños que ya no tienen acceso a las comidas escolares. Tres, proporcionemos un acceso más inclusivo de alimentos sanos y nutritivos a fin de erradicar el hambre y equilibremos la relación entre los sistemas alimentarios y el medio natural, transformándolos para que funcione mejor en armonía con la naturaleza y con el clima. Si hacemos estas cosas, podemos evitar algunas de las peores repercusiones de la pandemia del COVID-19. Debemos de motivar a los emprendedores por medio de políticas gubernamentales para que puedan ingresar en el sistema de producción comercialización y distribución de alimentos con ideas innovadoras que puedan dar soluciones sostenibles para el bienestar comunitario e ir disminuyendo la desnutrición. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias, Jocelyn. Indeed, that was a thought-provoking speech. Thank you so much. For non-Spanish Spanish speaking participants, a summary of Jocelyn key points our food systems are failing. This is clear that there is a global food emergency that could have lower terms effects for millions of people. This is imperative that we act now in the following ways, designating food supplies to countries in need while strengthening social protections, promote crop diversification and soil health method, adequate storage and distribution with fortification where necessary, regulation of additives and preservatives, maintenance of food hygiene and safe water. Is it's our job to motivate entrepreneurs through government policies to produce innovative ideas in this field. Now, it's the turn of North America, who is represented by Roberto Hernandez Juarez from Global Peace Mexico, Roberto, your question is, how can you leverage the advanced in technology to assist the developing innovative and creative skills required to accelerate the effective transformation of food system for a sustainable future? Thank you so much. Happy Youth Day, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, this morning from Mexico City. And yeah, um, I just wanted to highlight some points of uh, that were mentioned before. We are already facing a food crisis. There is people, there's youth in the context of International Youth Day. There's youth all over the world in the um, change, in the supply chain from all over the world. And we need to change that. We need to change the um, abilities and we need to change the the way that they're working. It's uh, unfair and they're facing hard situations all over the world. Talking specifically about the climate crisis and as it was mentioned at the beginning of the conversation with the uh, IPCC report, uh, there's no more time to, 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 to keep talking and just um, uh, stop the act that we need to to act right now we need to change that and specifically the youth all over the world we have this um heresy uh and it's our labor to to change that um also the sustainable development goals highlight um uh, as they they highlight they're all interconnected they're all related one to each other as human rights and when we talk about one specific problem implicitly there are other problems related so when we talk about technology and we talk about how we can change our 
um, supply chain all over the world, the way that we produce and the way that we consume, we need to start talking about a cultural and social reset. We need to change the way that we consume. We need to change the way that we dispose our food and we dispose our waste. We need to change this cultural idea, this appropriation. So um, there are some questions that I, that I love to highlight. And for example, here in Mexico, there's a specific state that love and produce uh, the mo mo more beef um, in the whole country and it's called Sinaloa. So um, the question is, how do, we, how do we tell people from Sinaloa, but this can also reply to other countries, how do we take people from, for example, in respect all cultures and countries, how do we tell Japanese people to stop eating fish? How do we tell people uh, from the Middle East to stop eating beef? How do we tell Asian people to stop eating pigs? How do we change that cultural idea when it's part of our own identity to change the culture of pasta, to change the, cult the culture of um, carne asada and other things? That's the main problem because our society and the way that we are built, the way that we construct our democracies is not sustainable. And the future that, that we are facing is sustainable. So how do we change it? How do we adapt? To, to face this problem. This is the major problem, a social problem. And uh, we can see some of these um, topics related to COVID-19. So that will be um, my, my comment. Um, that's the, the big um, problem that I think we're facing. And of course, technology is a big hand, but uh, we cannot change. And it will, the change wouldn't be possible if we don't start changing our behavior. That will be... Um, impossible technology can do it by itself thank you thank you robert that was an amazing speech we will now move to our last speaker for this session how montiel john ross hill from global peace jamaica represented the caribbean and this is your question my friend in what ways can we harness climate change that destroy the very existence of all islands and land is reclaimed by the sea. How can youth contribute to a more sustainable supply of food? Thank you so much for that question. One love everyone from Jamaica and from across the Caribbean region. We are proud to be a part of global peace and what it seeks to represent and achieve in the creation for a brighter future. For far too long, Caribbean governments have belabored the point of taking decisive action to mitigate the severe effects of climate change and develop meaningful strategies of harnessing the creativity and innovation of young people's skills for effective food system management that promotes a sustainable future. We can't wait any longer while our shorelines shrink Beautiful beaches ruined by rising sea levels. Crops are being destroyed by natural disasters. And rainfall is decreasing as atmospheric temperatures rise, resulting in longer dry periods. All of which debilitating effects it has on our economy and food security with a not so bright economic forecast. It is time for us to take action. According to IPCC 2021 climate report, the challenges which we face in recent history as a direct result of climate change are unprecedented and will have devastating effects on every part of the globe unless there is immediate action. Our future as small island developing states to mitigate the effects of climate change has had a negative impact on our food security as a region. Therefore, it is critical for us to develop meaningful approaches to harness the creativity of young people in pursuing agriculture as a lucrative profession. According to a 2017 World Bank report, the world will need to produce 60% more food by 2050 to feed the world's population. We must be prepared as youth to meet that global demand with quality products at high standards. Therefore, 
We need our regional governments, along with the private sector, to invest more in agriculture, to tap into these and other opportunities. We will only be able to capitalize on these opportunities if we act now. We'll be able to capitalize if we advocate for environmental protection and sustainable land, water, and forestry resource management. If we adapt quickly to changes in the global trading environment and toward a more intensive and sustainable agriculture in which we can pursue rewarding occupations that we can be proud of in aquaculture, mariculture, greenhouse farming, among, among others using modern technology. We will achieve this by fast-tracking agribusiness processing by investing heavily in research and technological skills as well as provide grants to the agribusiness entrepreneurs and reduce bureaucratic red tape. We will increase investment in agriculture, equipment and irrigation systems, and we'll have to abandon the machete and whole culture in favor of machine equipment resulting in higher productivity. In order for us to achieve this, we will need to develop seed banks and cold storage facilities so that we can become not only consumers, but producers of seedlings. In order to achieve this, we will need to form cooperatives with young farmers can collaborate to meet global demands through ITC technology, AgriMap, AgriNet, and be a part of a greater competitive advantage where small farmers in big cooperatives can now supply large export markets. Additionally, we need to increase coordination with the, within the CSME the Caribbean single market and economy to create a better competitive environment for small island governments to form a stronger economic and trading block to compete with the rest of the world. What I'm proposing is that for a more sustainable future, let us revolutionize the way we conduct agriculture through capacity building, technological advancement with a youth-centered focus. We are young people in this part of the world, not only desire to be doctors, engineers, software de developers, or the next big DJ or track star, but also we are a child in preschool can proudly say, I want to become a farmer. At that time, we will know we have secured a sustainable agricultural future. Thank you very much. The word is love. One love from Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean. Thank you so much, Montiel. Was a great and a passionate speech. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let's give all of them a thumbs in the chat box. Thank you very much for, for our distinguished speakers. You all gave an extraordinary speech. It's now time for our breakout session, which is the fourth part of this special event on this youth day now we will give you a way to the breakout session where you, you or speakers will have the opportunity to discuss with the other participants discuss face to face we want to listen to them and know your opinions from global peace we take care of them throughout inter intergenerational dialogues of global peace which is an opportunity for us to know better the ideas of the young people around the global problems and to be able to raise your voice to change the world. We will have six different sessions divided by regions and we will be guided by several great leaders. Jin, Jin Sin Yen Phoebe from Global Peace Singapore representing Asia. Mustafa Saeed, Global Peace Nigeria representing Africa. Pierre Jean Clos, Global Peace France, representing Europe. Hassel Raoul, Global Peace Nicaragua, representing South America. Marianne Bagari, Global Peace Canada, representing North America. And Dr. Adrian Dassel, Global Peace Barbados, representing the Caribbean. Ladies and gentlemen, let us then begin on the breakout session. Let's go.
We're going to wait a little bit to start the breakout session. I hope you enjoy the Global Peace Youth Day so far. And we gonna wait a little bit for the breakout session. Our technicians are doing well. Okay, yeah, you can enter in the groups in the in the um, in the sections of sessions group in the, in the uh, under cup. You can see the, the the three points, and you can select here the groups, and you can enter in the groups. Okay. What can I say if he's my please join the groups for your relative question? Hi Ross. I'm trying to join the breakout room and it won't allow me to join. Okay, let me check. One minute. Okay, thank you.
Hi, Mr. Vasu. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 VG. Yeah. <clears throat> Ah, why can't I'm here? Yeah, it seems.
Excellent. I hope you enjoyed this session very much. Now the moderators will give us the report of what, of what was discussed. Okay? The first moderator to present the report, it's Phoebe, representing Global Peace Singapore. Rose, we, need, we still need to wait for them. They are still coming. Uh, I, I, I thought that they come. Okay, perfect, no problem. Sorry, it was connection problem, I think so. Is okay? Hi. Did you hear me? Uh, we can hear you, Ross. Is okay? Yeah, we are back in the main room now, Isan. Ah, it's okay, I think so, right? I can speak, or? Yes. Okay, perfect. All we are here. Excellent. I hope you enjoyed this session very much. Now the moderators will give us the report of what was discussed. The first moderator to present the report, it's Phoebe representing Global Peace Singapore. Go on, Phoebe. Okay, so very short, there were, uh, we did a lot of self introduction, so we were not really able to discuss into details of uh, the impacts of youth. However, we were fortunate to have a Buddhist monk who shared the importance of using mindfulness as a way to self control and balance ourselves in the mood of the environment, um, understanding the crisis. We managed to talk a little bit about the importance of uh, kind of self-responsibility when it comes to food transformation. And I think most of us really do care, but we're too shy to offer their perspective, unfortunately. And I hope we can connect more. <laughs> so that's my report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phoebe. The next to give us their report is Mustafa, representing Global Peace Nigeria. Hi, um, we had a very good session with uh, my fellow Africans. Uh, the report was, uh, we have some suggestions and questions from uh, good parties that say they encourage uh, like training, farmers training, uh, introduction of uh, changing from uh, uh, cultural farming to mechanical mechanism farming. And also there's a suggestion of uh, putting the youth on the path of um, being uh, oriented since before going to the university because most of uh, the issues here in Africa, uh, people are always going after uh, medical doctors or something like that. So uh, introduction of or introducing of uh, the farming at the grassroots will help uh, encourage uh, the food system and food security in Africa. So I think with that, I think that's a short and precise uh, report I have from here. Thank you so much, Mustafa. The next to give us the report, it's Pierre Jean Claus representing Global Peace Friends. Go on, my friend. Thank you, Ross. Thank you very much, everyone. We had a very productive panel and we talked about strategies in Europe and now the European Union and the European institutions can foster participation of young people in farming as well as treating problems. One of the major challenges in rural areas and rural participation is the aging of European farmers. Between 2016 and 2019, for every farm manager under 40, there were three farm managers over the age of 65 in the EU. Aging of your farmers is one of the greatest challenges that rural areas are facing. Whenever you see that the CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, is impacting on generation-only renewal, it's mainly a positive thing. 
And the ideas that were submitted since 2017 by the commissioner, the commissioner at the time was Commissioner Hagen on agriculture. You can see that now you have the main, the, the main barriers to becoming a farmer are prices and availability of land, low profitability and administrative requirements. These three, three main challenges were addressed by the common agricultural policy. And you can see that ways of dealing directly with the problems of farmers could be supporting businesses start, start up from the beginning. You can see that there were as well possibilities of supporting knowledge transfer, advice and vocational training as well as incentivizing the transfer of farms and providing more support for investments, you can see that there are many policy proposals that can, be, that can be debated on and that can further be implemented in the European Union and in the world at large. Thank you, Ross. Thank you very much, Pierre Jan. The next to give us the report is Hassel Raul Benavides Quiroz, representing Global Peace Nicaragua. Thank you, Riaz, and thank you, everyone. It's such a pleasure to hear from you guys and everyone in just in general. Well, we were able to discuss mainly on the fact and how we can nurture, you know, chief entrepreneurs to best manage and support the food systems development in the post COVID 19 world. Uh, we were covering regarding the fact that how many or how much the unemployment rates are being declined uh, nowadays because of the COVID 19, but about the emerge of the you know new entrepreneurs and new enterprises around the world uh, being you know led by uh, developed countries at the same time and having in mind we could uh, discuss in detail about some projects success around the world uh, on the food system side and only the food system side taking into consideration that this actually applies also the environmental area as we are covering the waste management uh, field and how wh how water at the same time is managed uh, around the wall when it comes to trying to reduce this gap and on and, and some kind of opportunities and how the United Nations is having more opportunities for young entrepreneurs around the world, for example, for the good for uh, good for Good Food for All, uh, which took place from April to June 2021, and how the whole Price Foundation is also taking place and promoting more uh, joint leadership and joint entrepreneurs around the world. And at the end, uh, we could see uh, more in detail how this affected not only in the food system, but economically, socially, politically, and environmentally speaking at the end too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Raul. The next to give us the report, it's Mar Marjan Bagri, representing Global Peace Canada. Hello, everyone. It is my pleasure to be part of this amazing webinar from Canada. Actually, we did not get a chance to expand the issue, but all of us were actually a little bit shy about that. But in total, we agreed that technology is very important. Uh, science, technology, and innovation are essential to accelerate the transformation of agri-food system and combat hunger and malnutrition. Also, we discuss about the leveraging technology for a healthy planet will require collaboration between those who create the tools and those who understand the systematic challenges. Uh, and for conclusion, more discussion is needed to elaborate on the new issues such as bioscience, digitalization in agri-food system, the need for more investment in science and innovation, increasing the engagement of smallest scale food pr uh, producer, indigenous people, women, youth and private sector in agri-food system transformation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marian. The next to give the report is Dr. Adrian Desely, representing Global Peace Barbados. Thank you very much. Um, it was well, is a well-known fact um, in our conversation, what came out was the importance of understanding that the youth of our uh, respective um, countries is our greatest resource. 
it was it was said in our in our conversation uh, which consisted of um, several persons the role of youth in nation building is very critical and they looked at nation building from the perspective of if we cannot build food systems if we cannot build a secure food system then we can't build our nation it was also said that youth should be seen as the catalyst for policy changes within our system of of governance which means you should be given a more international voice to speak to how do we bring about social reform um, in our society. They also talked about the importance of understanding the nation, uh, the nation as a community and building community gardens. We looked also at um, the question of a system support, a system support that is that is um, propagated by the government. How can we get the government to see the benefit of agriculture beyond land? Um, one person suggested, you know, we need to look at the evolutionary thought of land rather than just, I don't have land, so I can't have an agricultural business. How do we get our governments to see land as so important that they're actually willing to separate land um, for us? Um, the next um, thought came out was, you know, how do we increase youth um, involvement with education by allowing, again, our leaders to push agricultural education from, the, from young childhood rather than waiting until we are 18, 19 years old. Another question, another thought that came out of our conversation was that young people have who are interested in, in, in agriculture has had to wait to get access to land, whether it is someone passing the family or trying to secure a loan. Um, they also talked about how do we change the, the concept of land and as it relates to agriculture. First of all, how do we make agriculture be seen as a business and an evolutionary business, a business that has different prongs of transformation as well as upper um, organization. Um, we also looked at you know, making food more inclusive. Um, one person suggested that we need to make food accessible to families by gathering original seeds from within the context of our diaspora and, and make farming rewarding. We need to sell the reward of farming Persons, they, they, they suggest that young people are not involved in farming because they don't see the direct reward. They think that they have to, maybe they have to wait for a long time. But how can we sell it and make it something that is attractive to our young people? They also talked about access land. Why is it that government isn't given more land or making land um, seen as something that we can go into? Um, rather than have to struggle for how do we transition that um, that African mentality away from slavery in, in attachment to land? How do we make our young people see that land is an inheritance? It's an opportunity for business that can be controlled by families, and that would be the report that came out of our group. I'm uh, Dr. Edwin in the beautiful Petro Barbados. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adrian. Many thanks to our moderator for all of you to, for contributing to these magnificent reflections in the report. Now, we will hear from Dr. Vasil Gundin and Kobla Asamani to make their closing remarks. Thank you very much, Ross. And uh, let me say, firstly, that uh, I think uh, it was a good decision uh, to start global peace. Because when I the last two hours and listened to, uh, I think it would be incorrect to say food for thought, because you have given us on this discussion of food sustainability, you have given us a lot of food for thought. Uh, that, and I was really inspired by all of the contributions. I think it vindicates uh, you as young people 
in that uh, leaders should know great ideas. You have fresh ideas, you have new ideas and ideas that can shape and change the world. And therefore, you know, when we said in the beginning, when establishing global peace, young people do not want leaders to talk about them. They want leaders to talk with them. And I think, uh, you know, just listening to the richness of the discussion here today, uh, it is definitely to the advantage of the world if the current leaders dialogue with yourselves, because you could come up with new ideas that can uh, help the world to deal with sustainability in the future. So I want to I want to say that we will continue these conversations. This was a conversation about the theme of food sustainability. There will be many other themes that we will discuss, and we hope that we will be able to bring uh, the breadth of your knowledge together uh, to contribute uh, to shaping uh, a better world. I want to also thank uh, Kobla, uh, the ever hardworking Kobla. I never know when he sleeps because he's always uh, on his uh, phone. And uh, sometime uh, if I wake up at uh, two o'clock in the morning, which is midnight where Kobla is, and then I mistakenly get his number, I quickly switch off because I know Kobla will be talking. And so he has a lot of energy. Uh, and I want to thank you, Kobla, and of course, Keenan, who is there going to do the vote of thanks, working with uh, Kobla, they make a great team, and all of the other people at the court who have contributed. Uh, as we move into the future, uh, we will have many more uh, discussions with all of you. Let me end this session by saying, Roz, uh, we are entering a very dangerous world, one in which I am concerned about the growing divide between the major powers in the world. Uh, all of you, if you are reading the newspapers, you are following what is happening in the world. You, you know, just last week, the NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization of Western Powers, had uh, military exercises uh, in the, uh, uh, on Navy exercises. And one of the British ships entered the waters outside uh, Crimea which is claimed by Russia. And Russia uh, scrambled uh, fighter aircraft uh, and uh, was threatening to bomb the British uh, Navy ship. If that had happened, we would have entered World War III. This is not even an exaggeration. This is exactly what would have happened. Now, this is how close we are coming to a major conflict in the world. You have not experienced uh, World War I or World War II, neither have I experienced it. I was not born during the Second World War. But when I look at the uh, historical pictures, the documentaries of the First World War and the Second World War, uh, then we know that we don't want to have such a thing in the world. When we look at what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki when they uh, atomic bombs were dropped. We know that today they are even more powerful, a hundred times more powerful bombs that exist. So you can imagine if we go to a third world war. So here yeah, I am very, very concerned as I look at the world. I have been working in conflict for over 30 years. I know what conflict is all about. I've traveled the world the situations of conflict and we want to avoid a major conflict between the superpowers. And I think that yourselves, you young people, working across those countries. So having young people from China and Russia and Europe and the United States working together can help to bridge the world. Because leaders don't have uh, the same motivation. They are motivated by different interests, different global interests. I am not here to judge them, 
but I am saying that they have those. You, as young people, this is about your future, and a world war will destroy your future. This is just plainly what it is. And I have often said that all the major powers, it is very strange and ironic that they cooperate in space. If you look at the International Space Station, all the major powers are co cooperating. United States, Japan, Russia, China, they all work together to put this International Space Station. And their astronauts, cosmonauts, they work together in space. Yet they cannot work together on Earth. They are conflicting on Earth. It's a very strange, ironic thing. And I think I put my faith in young people, yourselves, I think you as young people working across nations, because you are not encumbered by government, you are free thinkers, you are free movers across borders. And I think we can forge a new global solidarity through young people, a solidarity that will influence our current leaders to look to a more cooperative, sustainable world, because the problems of the world are not Russian problems or Chinese or American or British or whatever. They are common problems. Food security is a common problem. Population management is a common problem. Housing is a common problem. Food security is a common problem. The threat of nuclear war is a common problem. Climate change is everybody's problem. And if we didn't think that we had common problems, well, then the virus, COVID, came to tell us that it is a common problem for all of us. So I want to say, really, we are going to see how you all participate, because the global peace is not the founder of global peace. Global peace is all of you. You make global peace. And we are really wanting to see how you can all come together as young people and build bridges across the world so that we can build a better world. So thank you all for your continued cooperation, your contributions, and your passion and inspiration. This is what is going to shape a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Ross, for steering us so expertly also. Thank you so much, Dr. Vasugunding. Now I give the floor to my friend Klova Asamani to make his closing remarks. Oh, thank you very much, Ross. Um, it's been a very long journey and everybody seems to be tired. So I wouldn't say much because uh, the founder himself has said it all. Um, the time for young people to take action is now. We are free thinkers, free movers, and we need to come together and shape the world and make it a better place. And so we are global peace. We need to go out there and prove out to the world that indeed we are global peace citizens and we are working together to build a better world. Today's event has been remarkable um, as a result of the dedication of all of you ready to champion the cause of global development. The youth must lead. And today we've demonstrated that we are ready to lead with a good direction from our mentors like Dr. Gondin and the many others out there from the speech you heard from the executive director for UN Women, uh, it was a very remarkable speech. So together we are one. Let's continue to share ideas, follow social media handles, uh, like, share our comments, follow us. Uh, you can send us emails. Let's keep communicating the way we are doing. And I think our next major event will be the Global Peace Week, uh, which will coincide with the International Peace Day in September. And as usual, we are going to plan continentally. This around the planning will be in your hands because you are global peace. And so you must take charge of what you, the kind of action you want to take in the world and in your continent, in your country. So we are very grateful for all the, to all the speakers, to all our participants, to all our partners for your time. We look forward to meeting again. Until then, let's stay safe and move away from doing anything that will endanger our lives in terms of this COVID, which is killing mankind. Thank you very much and stay blessed. 
Excellent closing remarks by Dr. Vaso Gundin in Clova Asamani. To conclude my intervention on this excellent day, today I would like to thank all of you for actively contributing for this celebration of global peace. Remember that global peace is an initiative that promotes the development in all regions of the planet and seek to empower the young people who are so important in this 21st century to continue with, the, with a sustainable, harmonious, and just and inclusive development. Now, I pass the floor over to the company of Global Peace Italy, Nafisa Abul Kassim, to make a vote of thanks. Thank you so much to our great moderator, Rose. You have done a great job. Distinguished founder, all the is present, staff of the Global Peace, distinguished speakers, Global Peace citizen, and our distinguished participants. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to give me the thought of thanks. I'm very excited that I'm a part of uh, this historic event. On these notes, on behalf of Global Peace and the court, we are very grateful for your time and we wish to express our profound gratitude to everyone who has made this event possible and the success. Thank you, our founder, Dr. Vaso Gunden. Thank you, Mr. Kobla Alamani, the man who never sleeps and made sure this uh, event, this program become a reality. Thank you to our wonderful speaker from Japan, Paola Bellucci, who is expecting a global peace baby in our year to celebrate Global Peace Week next month, even in your circumstance, you did participate in this event. So thank you so much. We thank are you. also grateful to all our 19 speakers from across all nine continents. You performed remarkably. Indeed, you made our day. Thank you also to our participants for uh, coming. We look forward to working with all of you and together we will build a better world for all mankind. Stay safe and stay blessed. Thank you. After you, Ross. Thank you very much, Nafisa. Now I make the way to Kinan Governor, or event organizer from Global Peace Headquarters. Thank you very much, Ross. Uh, an absolute pleasure to speak here today and to um, just echo what everyone else has said. I don't want to really take away from all the amazing interventions that everyone's made and the closing remarks, but just to say um, a massive thank you um, to all of you who are watching, who are here today, um, to our Global Peace citizens. Um, you are the reason why uh, Kobla does not sleep, uh, because he is passionate about what he does, and we are passionate about youth action. So thank you um, to you young people who are not inactive, who are not sitting idle, but who are taking action to uh, create the world uh, in the vision that, that, that they have. Um, there's great passion here. There is great resilience. And I think uh, we really need to carry this forward. Um, that is all our GP citizens, friends of global peace, and just youth that have an interest in, in creating a better world. So Ross, thank you for brilliant moderation. I know earlier this week you were a bit uh, nervous, but you've done a fantastic job. To Kobla, thank you for your brilliant organization, your networking and uh, mobilization. And um, to our founder, Dr. Vasugandan, thank you for being an ally to the youth. Um, to everyone, please be safe and uh, please continue the conversation here. We will leave the, the meeting open. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kina. Thank you very much for, to all of you for coming. We look forward to meeting you again in our next events. Until then, you can still engage with us on our social media page. Follow us, like us, pass comments, and share our success stories on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and our website. We wish all of you well, stay safe from COVID, and stay blessed. We will leave the platform on for a while to YouTube network, okay? Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias. Merci. Obrigado.